I want to ask you three questions. Don't have to tell me the answer, just think about them for a minute. What do you think happens after we die? What do you think about there being life on other planets? And what's your dream? Not necessarily your dream job, but just your dream. This piece is called Asteroid RK1. And it's a piece about Manchester and outer space. Asteroids and addictions, meteorites and human rights, but principally it's about comets in the night sky and care, care on our inner city streets. Cosmic revolutions and local revolutions. I wanted to call this piece, How My Uncle Turned Into an Asteroid. But I thought it made it sound a bit like a comedy. And most of what I'm going to tell you in the short space that we have together, I don't think is necessarily in any way that funny. It begins in autumn 2006. At the time I'm 12 years old, 11 months, and roughly 27 or 28 days. And I know that because it was a few days before my 13th birthday. At the time, living in this well, lovely two-bedroom council house in Ardwick, and I've got beautiful brothers and sisters, so the house is a little bit overcrowded, and I'm sleeping on the couch, which I do not mind at all, because it means I have late-night access to the television and the fridge. But it also means, on the rare, rare occasions that my uncle maybe would stay, he would often stay sometimes on the couch opposite. My uncle is called Raymond Keaton and he's had a pretty horrible life. Doesn't matter what happened, it's not necessary to know and I don't think you ever do know unless it actually happens to you. But ultimately, my nana wasn't necessarily very nice to her children or to her husband. But my nana never, ever, ever, ever had it easy in her life at all. Which is the only reason that my mum finds the love and the strength to still forgive her. Now Raymond comes and he's a little bit ashamed that he doesn't know it's my birthday. And he's rummaging through this backpack that he has and he's looking at the bottom of it and he finds these two comic books, pages stuck together and crinkled. It was a Judge Dredd and a Superman. And I've never really been bought a comic before, so I'm over the mood and I'm trying to rip the pages open so I can read it. And I devour them in one sitting and I fall asleep. I get woke up in the early hours of the morning by the sound of the back door being unlocked. And my uncle is stood outside, smoking something long and suspiciously smelly. He clocks me, clocking him, and he turns to me and he goes, Oi, come on kid, it's your birthday in a few days, come out and have a couple of drags in this spliff. So I go out, and age 12 years old, on a crisp autumn evening when you can see your own breath, I had my first few drags on a spliff. <laughs> and I'm spaced out, and he puts me next to him and he starts talking about space and the planets and the universe. You see that there, kid? That one over there. That's Mars, that is. You can, you can tell that's Mars because it's, it's a little bit red and it doesn't flash. Only stars flash because they're big balls of gas that just eat themselves up and up and up forever and ever. Ah, this one there, can you see it next to the house? No, the next one, yeah, that bright one, that's a Venus size. You, you can tell it's Venus because it's the brightest one in the night sky. It's a planet of love, that is. You got a girlfriend yet, kid? Ah, oh, one day, one day. And that one there, that's Jupiter. Now Jupiter is the biggest planet of them all, kid. Bigger than all the Earths and all the moons combined. Right there. How about asteroids? You ever heard of asteroids, kid? Oh, there is millions of them, millions of them. Some of these asteroids are as big as your fist. Some of them as 
big as a car, some of them bigger than the biggest cities that you can imagine, and there's millions of them just floating around in the cold and the dark. And I'm high, coughing my little lungs up, mesmerised, pulled in by the gravity of the way that he tells the tale, and what he tells me next will fuck me up for the next five to six months. My uncle tells me that the world is going to end. Definitively, definitely, in one year, if we're lucky, maybe two years, but the world is going to end. There is a comet, a meteorite, an asteroid, he used them interchangeably, but the point was the same. There is a big ball of rock hurling through space of thousands of miles an hour with one destination, planet Earth, ready to completely destroy everything. Complete and utter human extinction, total annihilation, the apocalypse. And then he fucks off. And he goes to sleep, and he lies on the couch, and he leaves me there absolutely <laughs> terrified, right? And I, 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 I can't sleep, and for the next five to six months, I, I cry myself to sleep most nights. Fearful, terrified, and I always have the same nightmare. Always the same nightmare. And it's a, a comet rushing towards a body of water at sea on a beach in Spain somewhere and there's thousands of people trying to run away from the sea but it doesn't matter, it's too late and as soon as that comet hits that water a mega tsunami comes flying and it breaks everything in front of it bones, bodies, building, there's nothing that you can do and then it switches to fire, always fire fire running through the streets, through subway systems burning flesh, burning steel, burning everything and then I would wake up sobbing Terrified. And it wasn't necessarily the, the water or the fire that scared me, it was what comes after. What happens when we die? And I couldn't see any hope in any of it, whether it was being in heaven forever or hell forever or rotten in the earth forever. The idea of forever terrified me. The idea of eternity terrified me. I realised a few years later it was chatting shit. <laughs> like, not only because the world didn't end, but because you cannot see Mars, Venus and Jupiter at the same time on an autumn night sky. So he was bullshitting, but he terrified me in the same. He also used the word asteroids, comet and meteorites interchangeably. But there is a difference, and if you allow me to indulge you, I'm going to tell you the quick definitions. Now here is a comet. And here is an asteroid. The two are interplanetary bodies that are very, very similar, but with two main distinctions. And those distinctions are composition and location. Comets are found out in the coldest, coldest parts of our solar system. In the freezing and the dark, just beyond Neptune. Asteroids are found largely in a belt between Mars and Jupiter. There's another belt called the Kuiper Belt, but we're less interested in that one. Comets are made of space dust, rock and ice. And asteroids are made of space dust, rock and metal. Mostly nickel and iron, so that's the difference in composition. Comets. As they're flying through the universe at thousands of miles an hour, they're being beaten by solar wind and solar radiation and the nucleus starts to melt and it forms this atmosphere around it, this glowing atmosphere that has got the scientific name coma, which comes from the Greek kamata, and kamata means hair, which is how the comet got its name. Comets and asteroids. Now they both have a little cousin. The little cousin is the meteoroid. And the meteoroid can come from a comet or an asteroid. It can come from either two. The only difference is its size. It's a little bit smaller than one of these. Comets. Asteroids. Meteoroids. About a year ago, I'm walking down London Road, in front of Piccadilly Station. And I see this man walking up it. And from a distance, I can see he's got a big, dirty, brown bubble coat. And there's a badge 
swinging on his neck. I was paying attention to the badge and as I got closer I realised that I'd seen that badge before and it was a badge called the Rough Sleepers Badge. And for those that don't know, the Rough Sleepers Scheme is a scheme run by Manchester City Council whereby you'll only get access to certain hostels, food banks or other services for homeless people if you've been found by a small team of workers sleeping rough late at night. But there are thousands of spaces, nooks and crannies where homeless people sleep to escape shelter, to find shelter. And this is a really small number of people, so inevitably people always fall through the cracks and don't get help. I looked up and this man stopped. And I stopped. And I realised that that man was my uncle, Raymond Keaton. And in the space that existed between our gaze, there was shame, a thick sense of shame, and it wasn't shame on my behalf, it was shame on his behalf. I could see that he didn't want our past and his present to in any way meet, and he looked at me dead in the eyes and walked away, shifted his trajectory, just twisted around the corner. He was coming this way, but he turned. And I could tell by the way that he was looking at me that he didn't want me to follow him. And so I didn't. That was a year ago. That was the last time I saw him. Now, late that evening, I'm on the internet, on this late night Wikipedia binge, clicking on words that I don't know, going on tangent, on tangent, on tangent, and I end up 15 pages away. And I find this wonderful database run by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA. And it's a database of things called potentially hazardous objects. And these are asteroids, comets, and meteorites that have broken free from their main home and are catapulting around. And at some point in the next 200 years, <coughs> they might destroy planet Earth. Now, there's 1,700 of these. And as we speak, right now, as we're talking, there are scientists working in the North American Space Agency the Chinese Space Agency, the UK Space Agency, and the European Space Agency, 24-7, 365 days a year, they never stop monitoring these 1,700 stray rocks, constantly monitoring them, just in case there's a collision. And here are those bastards right here. Mm. Here they are. Now, they used to all have the comets of Greek and Roman gods for their names, but then they started to run out of gods, because there were so many of them. So they just gave them crazy little digits like 2010 JE87, 1993 VE1, 2012 VC82, 2015 FN118, and so on, so forth, so on. I'm scrolling through this table, just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And I stop. Because right in the middle of it is this one. 2006 RK1 and as silly as it sounds, as absurd as it sounds in my head that asteroid was my uncle logged and noted but ignored and lost and I couldn't get this image out of my head and the image started to grow stronger when I started to think of the idea of people who sleep rough in general. The idea of being lost in the cold, in the freezing and in the dark. Just tumbling around on the edges, on the periphery of society. And the idea of collision. And how actually attention is only ever paid when their atmosphere is greeted with our atmosphere. And that might be as simple as somebody saying, Excuse me, do you have any spare change please? Or it might be somebody freezing to death in the dark, in the cold, somewhere out on the street on steps, maybe not too dissimilar to this. Or it might be someone getting their head kicked in by a bunch of dickheads on a night out. Or it might be people forcing themselves into our presence by the erecting public tents 
right in the heart of our city centre. But attention is only paid when our atmospheres are met. And at the heart of this, the heart of it, was the idea of how people end up on the streets in the first place, or how a, a comet or an asteroid ends up becoming a danger. And the idea that actually it has to be something violent, it has to be something destructive, it has to be something cataclysmic, something horrible must have happened for you to be there asking me for your help. But knowing what I know of my uncle, and knowing what I know of other people who I've met and spoke to who are homeless, it isn't the violence, it isn't destruction, it isn't cataclysm, it's the little things in life, the little, little nudges, of course. The little tugs, the little pulls, when something pulls you out of your own system and the gravity is too strong to escape and you get lost. How actually it's the little things that send us off into orbit. Two weeks ago, I met some men from the mustard tree, ten men, whose names are John, Steve, Daryl, Matt, James, James, Mark and Terry. And those ten men made these asteroids here, using their own thumbprints and their own fingerprints to make the craters in these rocks. I asked them the same three questions that I asked her at the start. What do you think about after death? What do you think about there being life on other planets and what's your dream? And some of those men shared those stories. Not all, but some of them did. There was one man called Stephen who made this comet here. And Stephen wanted me to share his story with you. So if you wouldn't mind, for five minutes, I'm going to play his story. not the most smooth technical process in the <laughs> mm. And is there anything, your own story, a message about the way yeah, you yeah, want to share with the audience? My, like I said, I'm 47 years of age, 47 years of life. I've seen things, I've done things, I've achieved things, I've failed at things. And I'll start right back from when I was 13. My dad died at the age of, when I was 13 years old. And then I, I was brought up with two older brothers and an older sister. And my brother was up. 2001, my older brother died. Paul. And um, I, was, I, I had kids. I've got six kids to one woman. I was going through a bad time. At that time, I was a young man. I was in my 20s. And, well, I was in my 30s, actually. And I had four kids at that time. <clears throat> I, I had more houses than what they have on Monopoly because I'd, I'd, I'd been moving from house to house to flat, walking out of flats I didn't like. I eventually got a house on Wincroft Close in Basic uh, after moving into a flat. I moved out of a flat and I moved out of the house, but I lived in a caravan. I made myself homeless in 2001. I lived in a caravan with me missus at the time and two kids. It wasn't an ideal. But when people talk people talk about homeless, about people living in the streets, homeless is if you've not got no fixed abode, I wasn't paying rent at a place. If my brother owned a caravan, I wasn't paying rent at a place. You know, I was just living there because I had nowhere to live. Then the circumstances changed in 2004. My brother died in 2001. Got rid of the caravan. And 2000, that was in Prestatin, that was at, uh, in Prestatin in North Wales, then 2004, got another cover. Circumstances come back around again. Like you were saying in your story about the gravitational pull and things like that, and, and it came to me again, and this time I had four kids. But I delivered my kids and my missus, I lived on my own, and got another cover in, in real. And previously, uh, the other caravan, it, it was a bit, I, I don't know if, uh, it was different because here it felt, I was on my own and I felt isolated on my own. Do you know what I mean? 
And even though I do like my own company, I also like the company of other people. Talking about your problems, I've got post-traumatic stress disorder, and talking to people about your problems is the best way to deal with it. So then, I was at a caravan, we had a caravan for years, and we've dealt, lived in a caravan again. This time it was in real North Wales. And again, people might say, that's not homeless, you had some, you had a roof over your head. Maybe you did, but I've known people who've been homeless, who've lived in caravans and said they're homeless. Do you know what I mean? Then 2013 came along, my sister died. My sister had multiple sclerosis. Um, I, 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 my youngest child was born. Wasn't born in 2013, but he was born, I think he was born in 2005, 2006, I can't remember, it's so long ago. And he was born with muscular dystrophy. And then this year my mum died. The other night I was out on the street thinking, I, I was sat there for a couple of hours, a guy walked past me, give me two quid, and he asked for two quid, he just give me two quid, I said, don't want your money. But I just sat thinking, because me and my brother were thrown out my mum's house and we're in a flat at the moment, we don't want to be in the flat, it's awful. I'm trying to get work, can't get a job. And that's that's what scares me, I'm scared that I'm, I'm going to end up being on the streets and that's not what I want. It's really not what I want. I just want to make enough money to live on. Be happy in life. And get away from that awful area where I live because there's nothing there for me, my brother, my other brother, my nothing there for either of us anymore. I'm scared of what? What might happen? It's recording it. So the first question, if you don't mind, is what do you think about the idea of life after death? I've always wanted to live forever. Death is the most scariest thing in my life. And I always believe in reincarnation, not just reincarnation, but karma, you know, whatever you've been wronged in the past. 